What's up, everyone? Welcome to S Tech Live. I'm Tony, and I'm the social media coordinator here at the Peter E. Schmidt Company. We are a manufacturer representative for a bunch of different manufacturers in the New York metro area. And today is a very special day because this week we are celebrating SM58 Day. And instead of a usual S Tech TV video that we upload on the first Thursday of every month, this month is going to be this S Tech Live. And we are going to be featuring Michael Pedersen from Shore. He is a historian and is going to be talking all about the history of the SM58, share some stories about the SM58. It's going to be a great conversation. And that conversation is going to be led by our own Frank Conway. So I'm going to pass it off to them and they're going to get this thing started. So Frank, take it away. Well, thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm joined today with Michael Pedersen from Shore. And uh, this is going to be an exciting one for me. Uh, anytime I get to talk to Michael, uh, I learn so much stuff about Sure. Uh, to that, some of you might not know who he is. There might be one or two of you under a rock somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but I'd rather Michael explain that than me do it. He's had many roles at Sure, uh, currently holding the Sure historian position. Michael? Thanks, Frank. Uh, I started at Sure in 1976. Uh, I was in the sales department, or as you sales trainee. And I did sales for the first five years, and I really wasn't very good at it, uh, primarily because I was so into the technology. And as a sales guy, you know, the dealers want to talk about profit and, you know, how much am I going to make and where can I get my discount and so forth. And that didn't interest me nearly as much as the products did. So around 1981, I changed. I went into uh, product management, and for 10 years there, I was our product manager for circuitry products. Some of the products that came out uh, when I was there, the M267, our FP line of products, our automatic microphone system, various things like that. Did that for 10 years. That worries you out. For a very short period of time, I did what's called advanced product uh, planning, where I actually... Um, looked at advanced technologies coming out that we were working on. And then in 1993, <clears throat> excuse me, I got the idea of forming the application engineering group. We didn't have any place where people could call up and say, hey, I'm trying to do this. What do I use? Uh, or I'm having problems using this. So I started out application engineering, started out with three people. And now, of course, under Gino Sieges Mondi, I think it's 14 people. And year after year, they win awards in the industry for great best technical support. So that's something I'm very proud of. That's amazing. Around 2016, I was thinking about retiring. My wife was going to retire. I was thinking about it as well. And Chris Shavink, our president, came to me and said, you've done so much work on Sure History. Primarily, I did a lot of work when Mrs. Sure was alive with her. Uh, how would you like to be the co company historian? We'd never had that position before. And I said, ah, sounds like great fun. So uh, I reported to Mark Bruner. And uh, I've been doing this since 2016. And I will tell you, it's the best job I've ever had. It's so much fun. I learned so much. And with 96 years of history, uh, our anniversary is coming up um, April 25th. Uh, there's a lot to explore. And I learn new things and find new things every day. What could be better? Plus, my wife's retired and she doesn't want me at home all the time anyway. So there you go, Frank. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's a... Uh... That's a that's a really cool look down uh, memory lane and and um, and into your your background. And I know for a fact that we could probably I could ask you questions for days and, and <laughs> learn stuff. But uh, I know today we're here to discuss the uh, SM58. I think you've probably heard Indeed. of this microphone. Yes, um, I have heard of that. <laughs> in a couple of days, uh, it will be May eighth, or what we have. Uh, come to know as SM58 Day. Uh, and, you know, for us at the Schmidt Company, and I think everyone uh, around, um, there's some stuff about the 58 that people just don't know and, and you know, we find fascinating. And, and I know you would know it. So we'd like to ask you a couple of questions about that. And I think far, one of the first ones, away. yeah, one of the first ones, um, you know, it is such a uh, iconic microphone but the name implies, or started, I believe, right, as a studio microphone. And Correct. so we see it all over the place, live stages everywhere. And, and, you know, it's got so much of a presence there. 
what's that all about? I mean, could you walk us through how that might have turned, who might have helped to do that? Absolutely. So uh, early 1960s, Sure is making a lot of money off of phonograph cartridges. Really, microphones were secondary to us at the time. But in the studios, I mean recording studios, radio studios, TV studios, at the time, the big names were Electro Voice and RCA and AKG. Mm. Mr. Schur wanted some of that business. And so he appointed a guy named Bob Carr. Bob had started working for Schur in the late 40s. And Bob was made a one-man department, basically the professional microphone department. And his job was, let's get sure microphones into studios. How am I going to do that? He wasn't given much of a budget, so Bob started doing some research, and he found out some things that the studios wanted. They wanted microphones without on-off switches. They wanted them with, wanted them with XLR connectors. They wanted them with uh, balanced low impedance outputs, and they wanted them with non-reflective finishes. All reasons I think that I don't need to go into, but we will if we want to. And so Bob looked at our product lines, existing products, and decided to take some of those microphones and paint them and remove switches and add XLR connectors, conductors on them and call them all the SM line, the studio microphone line. So it started in 1964 when the first line came out, and it was about five or six microphones, all lifted from our existing product line, repainted, given new identities. And that's why they were called studio microphones, because we were trying to pitch those and sell them to TV, radio, and recording studios. And as we'll as we go along, you'll find out it didn't quite work out that way. But that's how it started. <laughs> that's interesting. I know that also, uh, you know, in that same sort of vein there, Shure makes a lot of and has for a long time wireless microphones. Can you yes. uh, point to the first time that we saw a 58 on one of the wireless products? Well, it was not a Shure product. Uh, it would have been in the 1970s. We had an OEM department at the time. They were called the OEM Original Equipment Manufacturing, where we would make products that would be used as part of other products. So there were companies all gone now that made wireless microphones back then. Some of the names were uh, C-Tech Vega, Sherwin Vega originally, I think it was. Um, Sony made some as well, of course, they're still around. Um, Edcore, Swintech, HME. These are all companies making VHF wireless, and they wanted SM58 heads on it because SM58 microphones were so popular with for live sound. So we were selling SM58 heads to these manufacturers. Yeah. And we, it was a nice business. Sometime in the early 1980s, someone at Sure, probably a guy named Sandy Schroeder, looked at how many SM58 heads we were selling to other wireless microphone manufacturers and said, you know, for every one of those mics that we're selling, we're not selling a wired SM58 and we're not selling our own wireless SM58 because we don't have any. Maybe that would be a good business to get into. So oh, we had, yeah, so we had been in the wireless microphone business from 1953 to 1960 called with something called the Vagabond. Right. Uh, and it was, it was the world's first handheld wireless microphone, very expensive, not reliable, particularly because it had vacuum tubes in the transmitters. So we got out of the wireless microphone business in the 1960s. Uh, and then we got back into it in 1986 with a joint development between Shure and Telex. Uh, and the one thing we did, which made a lot of our competitors unhappy, is we stopped selling them the SM58 head. We kept that no, for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was a smart thing to do, too. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so um, I'm curious, where is SM58 currently made? They are made in um, Juarez, Mexico, which has our, been our plant since 1985. Uh, very important. That is not a contractor plant. That is a sure plant, sure owned, sure employees. Just happens to be in another country. And we're also making them in Shuzhou, China as well. So they're made in both of those places. Uh, again, both plants owned by sure, sure associates, sure quality standards, everything the same. Just happen to be outside the United States. What else do, uh, what else is, um, it's manufactured in Juarez? Oh, geez, a lot, a lot of different things. Uh, you know, uh, SM7s are made there as well. Okay. Uh, we used to make our phonograph cartridges there. <clears throat> Much of the wireless is made there as well. So, you know, it's, it's a whole list of things. It's a, it's a fairly large plant. And again, we opened it in 1985. Uh, and it's been a great addition to us. As a matter of fact, 
our quality standard, or actually our quality levels actually went up after we opened it at. They were, they were, they were so proud of the, the work that they do there. So it's been a great place. So a lot of different things. I don't have the list off the top of my head, but most everything. Nice. Yeah. It's a, it's an impressive facility. I've, I've seen many, I haven't been myself, but I've seen many pictures of uh, ORS facility. And it's like you said, it's a, it's an entire shore complex. So, well, I have one that um, it's actually maybe a, a two parter. I think it, it lends itself to uh, the 58 has been around over 50 years. Uh, one of probably the most iconic microphones arguably out there for live stage performance. What do you um, associate to that popularity? And I think to that, uh, one of the things that I think we see a lot is its um, undying durability, which might be one of the things that really <laughs> lends itself to the popularity. But if you want to take us through what you think on those maybe two topics, I don't know. Yeah, undying popularity. Well, I've got mine. Uh, I don't have it with today. I'm using a Shure MV7, but um, I've got two. <laughs> yeah, my my mine was from 1972, 1973. I would guess. Yeah, you know, I bought it back then. Problem. Never re never replaced it. Works just fine. So that's the first aspect of it. I I tell people getting into industry. I said, you know, what does an SM58 cost on the on the street now? 100, 109, 120, something yeah, like that, right approximately. I tell somebody, if you can afford that and you buy it and you take care of it, you never need to buy another microphone in your entire career. It's you true. Know? So that's a, that, that's a good start. Uh, and I'll say things like, uh, take, check Roger Daltrey of The Who. Don't you think he's rich enough to afford whatever microphone he wants to use? And he uses the SM58 and always has used the SM58. So you got the durability aspect of it as well, uh, the first part. Second part is I think it's very much like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has got a certain taste that everybody loves. The bottle has a certain feel that everybody loves. They just got the right combination of weight and taste and design. And I think that that's what happened with the 58. It just feels right in your hand. Uh, the presence peak makes your voice sound great. The proximity effect, you can use that when you want to build up the low end of it. It's just got it all. You're probably too young to remember when Coca-Cola tried to change their formula. This is, I think, in the night, late, late 1980s. They wanted to, they saw Pepsi coming up in the rearview mirror. And so they changed their formula to make their Coke taste more like Pepsi. And man, their loyal customers went crazy. And Coke realized eventually, in hindsight, they actually had new Coke and classic Coke for a long period of time. Uh, and then they eventually got rid of new Coke. But, you know, when you've got it right, you just leave it right. And that's what I always say about the 58. You know, we're, we're going to improve it, but we're never going to touch it because it's just the right sound, the right feel, the right appearance, and the durability. Come on. And it's 100 bucks. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You know, um, well, first off, I think it's awesome that you think I'm too young to remember the Coke thing. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, do, you, but, do you remember it? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. I do remember. It, was, it did not go well. You're right. They, it was uh, so stupid. <laughs> It was so it, stupid. They definitely you know? suffered from that one. And I do know that, you know, I, I've had some conversations with some guys over the years, and I know that there's a band, like a three-piece band, uh, I want to say out of, uh, let's say, Ireland, maybe, that uh, the singer of that band, he is definitely very attached to his 58 for the same reasons you mentioned, the, the capsule and the, uh, and the feel and the weight and all the things that just make it feel like home for him. So I'm sure that's it. I get I got to tell you a story about Ireland. So Jamie Griffin, who's our head of operations, he's our VP of operations. And he came to Sure about, oh God, maybe three or four years ago. And he's a guy that just fit into the Sure culture from scratch, from the start. You know, some people come in there and they're like, oh, this is weird. And other people come in and just feel like, oh, this is home. Anyway, so Jamie is from Ireland. And Jamie uh, used to build, uh, he was head of operations for Lenovo Computers. So he comes from the computer background. So he sees this opportunity of coming to work for a company called Sure and doesn't know anything about it. And so he starts doing research and he calls a, uh, a cousin of his in Ireland that is a musician. And he's saying, cousin, I'm thinking about going to work for a company called Sure. Can you tell me anything about that? And uh, his cousin says, Gee. he says, they make a microphone called the SM58. Perfect. If you don't screw it up. <laughs> oh yeah 
So, you know, I, was, I was you know. curious too. Is one of the one of the questions I was wondering about, um, which I think you probably answered why, and and I probably even answered it when I was thinking about asking you uh, along the lines of that: if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Thing. Uh, right. But we both know lots of engineers, and we both know that technology changes all the time. I mm. wondered if there was ever a point internally where someone said, and, and I'm not relating this, we could talk about beta separately, uh, yeah. but I'm wondering if at some point someone actually said, I can make a better version of that. And and <laughs> and how that might have gone, you know, it's well, that's what that's where the beta 58 came from. Um, but uh, there was a time around 1970 where, so the SF-58 came out in 1966 and it was not a big hit. In fact, uh, you know, I always ask folks, guess how many SF-58s we sold our first year? And, the, and, you know, and you get these wild guesses. And I said, no, we sold 145 the entire year for the first year. That's, that's how poorly it did. And after now, it's around 1970, SM58's been out about for four years. And really, frankly, none of the SM microphones have taken off yet. And our vice president of sales at the time, a guy named Ray Ward, he decides to have a meeting and basically announces, well, you know, Bob Carr, that's the guy who started the SM, says, we've given your line six years now. It started in 1964. None of this stuff is going, I think we should just continue the SM line. <laughs> <laughs> because wow. you have to realize, you have to realize at the time we were making phonograph cartridges and we made hundreds of thousands of those things. Yeah, it's true. And we made a lot of money on it, right? So he's looking at we could spend our time over here making phonograph cartridges, and over here we have a microphone we sold 145 units last year. I mean, it wasn't the it wasn't the an illogical thing to think at the time. No. So um, a guy named Roger Ponto, and he was the national sales manager at the time. Actually, the guy that hired me, by the way said to Ray Ward, he said, well, before we get rid of this, we've got it. We've invested in the tooling and everything. Maybe we're just trying to push it to the wrong market because we're still trying to sell it to radio and TV and, and stu recording studios. He said, let me take a few of them out to Las Vegas. There's a lot of live sound that goes out there, a lot of live, you know, bands every night. Maybe it works. Maybe it'll work good as a, you know, as a live sound mic. And the guys in Las Vegas picked it up and then it started to pick up steam because bands were coming through Las Vegas and performing. Hey, what's this? You know? And so it really was the 1970s where things started to pick up. Uh, and then by the time the eighties came around, early eighties came around, we knew we had a hit on our hands. So nobody wanted to change it, but there's been lots of improvements. You know, there's improvements uh, where we used to use an adhesive. We use like laser, laser welding now. Um, the material in the acoustical path used to be a type of wool. Now it's a, uh, a synthetic material because it doesn't absorb moisture. So I would say over the years, there's probably been 60, 70, 80 improvements, but we don't patent them. And we don't announce them. They're trade secrets because number one, if you do patent them, then your competitors know what you've done. <laughs> right. And if you not, if, or and if you announce them, if you get on social media and say, hey, we used to do this and now we do that, then the counterfeiters know what you've done. Mm, that's an interesting one too. You know, you, you, you bring up something that I was, we were curious about too. The 58, again, we've, we've been, this microphone's been around for over 50 years. It's inevitable that there'd be counterfeit. Can you help uh, the people that be watching this identify an authentic and what they should look for? You should just make sure you buy it from a dealer, from a, uh, okay. you know, an authorized sure dealer. We, we don't Some of them are tell really good, haven't they? As far as like, as far as how they look, yes. Right. How right. they sound, no. Right. Um, and there, there are lots of things. So we don't put that information out there because, again, you know, counterfeiters could be watching us, and they go, "Oh man, I didn't think about that." And so it's a lot of tiny little details that we know what to look for. So all we can say to folks is buy it from an authorized dealer. If you, you know, and if you don't know who authorized dealers are, call the Sure Rep office or call Sure. We'll help you out with that. Right. But if you buy it from an authorized dealer you're going to be certain of this. You know, if you if you go on eBay and you see one that says, wow, all the dealers are selling for $100, and here's a guy that's selling it for $50. Guess what? I don't think that's the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good point. Authorized dealers. I like it. Um, how about, so it, this is an interesting, I think, current situation, current world events, we'll call it, over the last mm. 12 or 14 months at time of, recording this 
uh, we're a bit more aware and uh, obsessed with cleaning things and making sure things mm. are sterile or uh, safe for use. Right, uh, and that come, you know that, that'll make its way down to a, a microphone, and, and so any kind of words of wisdom there on what people can do for sharing, or maybe well, not sharing. You know, <clears throat> I'm not a microbiologist. No one that sure is, as far as that goes. <clears throat> I do it on the weekends, but not. I don't want to do it during the week. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do today is, you know, first of all, the ball can be taken off and washed in warm soapy water and then rinsed out and let it dry overnight. That's a good thing. You know, if you can wash your hands and get rid of germs, you can wash the ball, the same thing. You can also use, um, you know, um, a little bit of al alcohol on a rag and wipe the handle off. So, th you know, things like that are fine. It's just really common sense, but we've never done testing. You know, all we can say is here are suggestions that we have, basing them upon what the uh, CDC tells us to do with our hands and other objects and just say, do that. But the one thing we don't recommend is you don't want to use alcohol on the grill because there's foam inside the grill and that alcohol can attack the foam eventually. So just use warm, soapy water, uh, rinse the grill off, let it dry overnight to make sure that when you put it back on, it's not wet. And, you know, wipe the handle off, uh, maybe with Clorox wipes and that's it, should be good to go. Yeah, you know, to that same end, we do sell just the grill too. So, I mean, maybe people could own their own grill. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You mean, if you go to a place where it's, it's like the, the, the bars SM58, sure you could own. Yeah. And what's a, what's a grill? Eight bucks, something like that. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's definitely uh, a, a, probably a safe investment. If that's what the concern is, I think everyone should yeah. own their own. Like I said, <laughs> two, one. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so you know what? Let's let's give a throw out there to uh, the man himself. Uh, ben Bauer invented the directional Unidyne microphone technology. I don't think he had it at that point probably any clue how uh, it would change the way we handle audio into a microphone. But you know, and kind of curious about Ben or maybe the Bauer family did. Did anyone else in the family do anything in audio um, or was it really not just that I'm a... aware of? Yeah, not the way. <clears throat> First of all, true genius, just an amazing yeah, right. genius. Yeah. And, I, I, uh, I, I've seen, you, you know, you showed me some of the original stuff that when I was uh, with you in, in Wheeling, some of the original stuff he came up with. And you're right. It's just, it's um, amazing how people can come yeah. up with this stuff it just that's yeah he was, <clears throat> he was brilliant i mean his you know he, he invented the uniphase acoustical principle which is what makes the microphones directional when he was 24 years old right i mean just and, and no one had done that before and he figured it out now today in 2021 how he gets 95 percent of the microphones in the world use some variation of what ben came up with so <clears throat> he was he was amazing had a 40-year career um when he died at age 65 he had over 100 patents to his name um but the his family the bauer family his original name was baumsweiger by the way he shortened it to bauer in 1941 primarily because sure had a lot of military contracts during world war ii and oh. every time the military personnel came to sure to check up us on us they would meet ben baumsweiger and they would say baumsweiger is that german you know, mm. and so he got tired of that eventually, and he shortened it to Bauer. So the family has kept Bauer. Uh, I know many of the family, they are very, very high functioning. It's kind of like if you don't have a PhD, you don't belong in the Bauer family, basically. Uh, <laughs> I bet. It's probably a tough, that was probably tough at, at holidays, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Doctors, lawyers, you know, scientists, just uh, astonishing. But to my knowledge, no one in the Bauer family followed up in the audio aspect of it but true genius you know enough, right so yeah he probably covered the whole family as far as <laughs> yeah he probably did <laughs> uh, i i only actually had uh, one other one it really was more of a fun one that i was just curious your take on uh this is a personal thing because we're spending we've talked about sm58 for the last half hour i wondered do you think it's brother the 57 is mad that it doesn't have its own day of celebration <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I actually was interested about that. You know, I thought I always thought that SM57s and SM58s sold about the same. Turns out that I think the last time I looked, 
I think it's about five or six SM58s for every SM57 sold, something along those lines. A lot of aspiring singers, I guess. Not as many as of, of us uh, people that want to record our our yeah. drums or guitar for, amps or something for, like that. Yeah, for the viewers, you need to know the 57, 58 are the same Unidyne 3 element. The only difference is the grill. Um, and the grills change the high-end response a little bit. Um, someone asked me the other day, he said, well, how can that be? I said, well, you have to realize that the SM57 or 58 diaphragm, when it's moving, moves typically about a millionth of an inch. So if you can imagine something that's a million, moves that little bit, a millionth of an inch, it doesn't take much of a change to the acoustic environment around it to affect it. And someone said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, imagine a fly landed on it, <laughs> on the diaphragm. <laughs> Don't you think that would make it? Yeah, well, it probably would. So you change the grill, you change the high-end response a little bit. But they are both Unidyne 3s, uh, and no matter what you read on the internet, uh, they are basically the same inside. There you go. Well, as always, this is a you know it's a highlight of my week. Easy. <laughs> You're very kind. I appreciate that. Some time with the mighty Michael Patterson. <laughs> um, Michael, this has been incredible, and I really appreciate you taking the time and doing this. Thanks, Frank. I enjoy it. I, I love telling the story, and uh, you're a good listener, so it's very easy for me. <laughs> well, we'll have to do many of these over many topics then until people are sick Anytime. of listening. Anytime. Just uh, ha happy to be here. All I got to do is move up to the second floor of my house. How easy is that? Come on. Yeah. Hey, I'm in. Let's let's uh, let's continue this. So with that, I'll uh, I'll hand it back to Tony, and let him uh, take it away. So, Mister Pavakwa, it's all you. Thank you, Frank and Michael, for an amazing conversation today. I really learned so much about the SM58 today, and I hope you have too. I mean, it's such a classic microphone, and if you don't know about it, well, now you do. If you want to learn more about our manufacturers that we represent, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. We are always uploading new content. So go and check us out. There are links down in the description below and you can find us. So thank you all so much for watching this special edition of S-Tech Live on SM58 Day. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something.